Okay, so pretty soon, uh, not, not in this lecture or even the next lecture, but two lectures from now, uh, we are going to formally introduce the idea of feedback control. Um, everything we're doing up until that point is sort of a background on the mathematics and the conceptual understanding of the dynamic system um, that it's a prerequisite for understanding how feedback control works. Uh, ultimately, as I as I mentioned a few times now, this feedback control structure it's, is, is what's going to allow us to manipulate the closed loop behavior and sort of allow us to change how a particular system behaves uh, based on that controller that we design. Everything up until this point, however, has been understanding how the plant itself, which is again the the system dynamics <clears throat> that we're trying to control, you have to understand the dynamic behavior behind that system before we can close the loop and do any kind of meaningful control design. Okay, so in today's lecture, uh, we're going to talk about something called the time domain specification. Okay, so in the last lecture, we learned about the poles of a particular transfer function. Um, the poles are super important because the poles essentially um, dictate the behavior of that particular system depending on where those poles exist in the um, the two-dimensional complex s-plane. Okay, so what we're going to try and do today is bring up a new topic called the time domain specification but also relay it, um, sorry, we're going to relate it back to the pole locations. Uh, and so hopefully we're going to build up this vocabulary of essentially how to characterize an output based on the poles of that particular system. Okay, so we're still focusing on the plant here, the, the dynamic system within this feedback control system. We're still trying to analyze that. Um, and for the purposes of the time domain specification, we're going to consider the plant to be a second order system. Uh, the reason for this is because the second order systems are the minimum order system required to see any interesting um, sort of oscillatory response. Um, if you recall from last lecture, first order systems, uh, when hit by a uh, an impulse or a step input, there's no oscillation because it's, it's only got one real pole on the uh, real axis. So you're never going to see any interesting oscillatory behavior from a first order system. Uh, second order systems have potentially pairs of complex poles which can exist out in the s-plane uh, on, on, at a location that's not the real axis and that's the minimum system order required to see those interesting types of dynamics so we are going to study a second order system but in the most generic form okay so I've given you two versions of the second order transfer function here uh, one is in terms of the system poles okay so Sigma and Omega okay so the poles of a particular system are s equals minus sigma plus or minus j omega. So sigma represents uh, the sort of the real component of the pole, whereas omega is the imaginary component. There's another way to write a second order um, transfer function in its most generic form. That's in terms of the system properties, which is uh, zeta here, your damping ratio, and omega n, which is the undamped natural frequency of that particular system. Um, and then there's a conversion factor that allows us to go sort of back and forth between those two versions of that system. Okay, so all we've done so far is we've just outlined this completely generic second order transfer function. What we're going to do with that is we are going to actually um, apply an input to it. So we're going to take a look at a forced response for that particular uh, plant and we're going to apply the input u of t equal to 1, which looks like a unit step input. So we're basically going to apply a constant force to that second order system, and we're going to look at the output y of t, which is referred to as the step response. Okay, So this is a step input. The response due to a step input is called the step response. And so we're going to look at the second order step response for that um, generic second order system. Okay. Now, 
typically if if the system is um, uh, lightly damped enough in other words if the system oscillates and the poles are complex then a typical second order typical second order step response will look something like this okay so you've got this is the output uh, the the second order step response will look something like this it's going to start at zero it's going to go up we'll generally overshoot the final value by a little bit will oscillate and eventually come to some steady state value okay so some steady state value which for the moment we'll just label one sort of sort of uh, normalize it doesn't have to be one though no. it most likely will not be one uh, unless something called the DC gain is equal to one. Uh, nonetheless, the point I'm trying to make is that for any particular second order system, this is a pretty typical response that you might see. Okay, now remember, the whole point of using feedback control is to try and shape the output in a very specific way, right? For example, you know, if you're designing like a cruise control module for an automobile, you wouldn't want to see a response like this. You wouldn't want a lot of oscillation because that means as you set the uh, set point for your speed, uh, for your cruise control, your speed's going to first go past, right? It's going to go past where you want it to be. Then it's going to dip below where you want it to be. And it's going to sort of hunt for that set point until it finally finds it, okay? So the point I'm trying to make here is that the whole purpose of feedback control is to be able to precisely shape the output in some desired way okay now the reason I'm drawing this second order response here first and not labeling it at all is because I want to pose a question of well if we need a precise way to describe this how do I do that okay the the question is well how what vocabulary do I use to define this squiggly picture that I've drawn here right this is a second order step response but what do I say? Okay, what, what I might say is, well, uh, it starts at zero, and then, like, it kind of, like, goes up kind of fast. That's accurate, right? And then it, like, you know, it hits sort of, like, some maximum value, and then it, like, goes back down, and then it kind of wiggles for a little bit. And then, at some point, it kind of goes, like, flat. Okay, so... Uh, Everything I just mentioned, or everything I just said, is true. Right? It's an accurate statement. Everything I just said. Point is, it's not going to cut it. It's not. It's not precise enough um, for engineering purposes. We need a more um, definite set of vocabulary to describe this particular output, um, and that's part of what the first portion of this lecture is: is to define the vocabulary that's used to characterize this type of uh, of output. Okay, so. Um, the, the rate, so I, so I said, okay, it goes up kind of fast. Okay, so one way to um, denote the speed of the response is by something called the rise time. The rise time is the amount of time it takes. We'll call this, uh, okay, yeah, so the amount of time it takes to get from 10% to 90% of the final value. on the response. Okay, so the rise time itself is the amount of time it takes to get from 10% to 90% of the final value. The rise time is a measure of the speed of the response. So instead of saying yeah, it goes up kind of fast, you can say, oh, it's got a rise time of 0.32 seconds, and that's much more precise. Okay, so we've got, we've got the rise time. Uh, another one is called the peak time, and that's that one's a little bit more straightforward. The peak time is how long does it take for the response to reach its maximum value? Okay, so this timestamp here alone is called the peak time, and it's a, the time at which you hit the maximum value. The peak time is another way is another way to somewhat characterize the speed of the response, but it has different implications. Okay, so you got rise time and peak time for sort of the speed of the response. Another interesting parameter is this um, this maximum value, okay? But we don't generally characterize the, the maximum value by its absolute value. We actually characterize it by the percent beyond the final value 
that it uh, that it exceeds. Okay, so the f something called the maximum overshoot m sub p is the um, the percentage above the final value that the uh, response um, ultimately hits at its at its largest value. Okay, so something called m sub p is called maximum overshoot. And this is generally given as a percent, right? So if this final, so if the final value itself is one, and let's say the peak value is 1.2, your maximum overshoot would be 20%. Okay, as an example, um, in my description, I also said, you know, later down the line, I said, look, it kind of wiggles for a little bit, and then it kind of goes flat. Okay, um, mathematically, as we're going to see in a little bit. Um, the way to characterize this is essentially in a decaying exponential multiplied by a sine wave, and that's what gives you this sort of oscillatory decaying behavior. Now, mathematically, we know that this line ne never actually goes flat, right? It's an exponential um, uh, approach to zero, but it never technically gets there. But as engineers, we need a way, we need some cutoff to say, all right, we've basically reached the steady value how do we define that? Okay, and so that's called the settling time. And the settling time can be defined in a number of different ways. Um, but essentially what you do is you place this sort of envelope, say plus or minus 1% about the final value, and however long it takes for your response to be within that envelope is called the settling time. Okay, so the settling time is a measure of uh, the convergence, the rate of convergence of a particular um, response. Okay, so we've got settling time here, and this has more to do with the steady state response. Settling time. Settling time. <clears throat> okay, so we've got this set of four vocabulary words now that define a particular second order step response much better than what I had done originally. Okay, so instead of what I said before, I could say something like, oh, we've got a second order step response, got a rise time of 0.12 seconds, uh, max overshoot of 13.5% at a peak time of 0.3 seconds, and a settling time of 8.5 seconds. Okay, so all of those parameters give a much clearer, more definitive picture of what the response looks like than, oh, it goes up kind of fast and wiggles. Okay. Um, this vocabulary is the starting point for this lecture. Okay, so being able to characterize a response like this is one major component of, of this lecture today. Um, the second part of it is connecting all of this stuff back to the system poles so that we can say definitively, oh, if my system has poles in some particular portion of the S-plane, we know that we are going to have, say, an overshoot of, of less than 10% or so. Okay, so that's the part that we're going to bridge today. That's the gap that we're going to try and cover today. Okay, now if we look back at the original, if we look back at, at the original second order transfer function, okay, and we look at this diagram that I've drawn here, this sort of generic kind of second order response, well, Mathematically, we have the tools available to start with the transfer function and actually compute this analytical step response, right? We can actually compute a formula for this yellow line because it's simply a step response, right? It's a, if you think back to lecture two where we did the forced response, the step response is nothing more than a forced response where the input happens to be a unit step. Okay, so what I'm saying here is we can actually do some analysis on the generic form of that second order transfer function by computing a step response. Okay, so so strictly speaking, the plant transfer function, right, we know that's the Laplace of the output divided by the Laplace of the input. That's the definition of the plant transfer function. However, if we want to compute a force response, we generally solve for the output as the product of the plant times its input in the S domain. Okay, we, we know the plant, we have a general form for that, and if the input is a unit step, that means that U of T equals 1, and therefore, 
u of s, which is the Laplace transform of little u of t, becomes 1 over s. We just look at the Laplace table. So now I know big U of s, and I know big P of s. I can actually compute the force response in the generic form. What that looks like is the following. So the plant, I'll just pick one version. It really doesn't matter which version you choose. In the notes that are posted, I've, I've picked this version. Um, and the forcing function, the big U of s, that's 1 over s. Okay? What I want is a little y of t. Uh, so what I need to do is to take the inverse Laplace transform of this product over here. Now everything is symbolic, but that's fine. We know how to handle this type of um, s domain function using our um, partial fraction expansion and some tools um, to solve for the coefficients. Okay? So I'm not going to do all this on this lecture. You can refer to the, the notes for the full derivation of this, but essentially it's just a it's just a straightforward partial fraction expansion where the setup uh, looks like this, right? So it's a over s, that's your distinct real root, and then we've got basically quadratic um, denominator over here. So we need a first order polynomial in the numerator for the second term. Okay, and then you just go through the process, use c, d, e, n, c to find your coefficients a, b, and c, take the inverse Laplace of this sum uh, of, of two terms, and what you get is the actual step response. Okay, so what I will do is I will summarize, because this is really just review at this point, I will summarize taking the inverse Laplace of all this, and I will simply write down the step response that I computed. I'm really only writing this down because it's important to see the form of the step response, right? So I, I'm not so concerned with your ability to take the inverse Laplace. That's in the notes, and I think that it's straightforward enough that you can work through that yourself. Okay, so the the actual step response ends up looking like 1 minus e to the minus sigma t times cosine of omega t plus sigma over omega sine of omega t. Okay, this is your actual generic second order step response. Okay, So we'll call this the generic second order step response. And this is exactly a plot of this squiggly yellow line. Right? If you think about it, there's some steady state value. Right? That's your final value. And then there's this decaying exponential multiplied by a purely sinusoidal term. So that's where you get this sort of decaying squiggliness, okay? if that's a word. Okay, So this is basically an analytical form for the original yellow response that I've drawn up there. Now, what we're going to try and do for the next portion of the lecture is notice that this form, okay, the step response, is actually in terms of sigma and omega, right, which are essentially the poles of the transfer function. And through these conversions up here, we can actually relate sigma and omega to zeta and omega n. Okay, the, the system properties, like the damping ratio and the undamped natural frequency. So what we're going to try and do is develop some expressions that relate these four uh, response parameters, like rise time, peak time, overshoot, settling time, to these parameters like sigma, omega, omega n, and zeta. Right? That's what we're going to try and do because if we have that relationship, that's the first part of bridging the gap between, well, how do we shape this response the way that we want, um, and connecting that to, well, where do the poles need to be for that particular system? Okay, so so given that we have the actual analytical form, well, I don't know. We can start pretty much anywhere. Um, what comes to mind for me is to look at the peak time first. Because if you look at this yellow plot, right, we've got the peak time is the time at which we hit our maximum value. In other words, the derivative for the function should be zero at that maximum value. Okay, And we have the actual y of t function here, so it stands to reason that to compute the peak time, the way to compute that 
is by taking the derivative of y of t and setting it equal to zero and solving for t, right? Whatever time, um, whatever time you get from this computation can be defined as your peak time, okay? So that's precisely what's done in the notes. So in the notes, we actually take this analytical function, just take the derivative of it, set that equal to zero and solve for t. And what, what comes out of that is something that we'll define as the peak time, and it's actually nice and clean. It, it just works out to be pi over omega, which is the same omega that you see here. It's the damped natural frequency for the system. Okay. Again, I don't want to do that entire calculation because it's really just high school calculus. It's just taking the derivative and setting a function to zero. However, if you want to review it, the whole derivation is in again in the notes. Okay. So the way we get an expression for the peak time is to take the derivative of y of t and set it equal to zero. Okay. So we have an expression for peak time in terms of omega. Let's look at the overshoot, right? The maximum overshoot here, well, that's the natural next step to take here because the maximum overshoot is the value of y of t evaluated at the peak time. So we know the time at which we hit the maximum. Now it's just a matter of plugging back in to find the maximum overshoot. Okay, so if we plug in y of t of p, that's what we're going to use to find the maximum overshoot. And what you end up getting if you plug in to this original function is, well, you end up getting a 1 plus, um, you, you get a 1 plus e to the minus sigma tp. So, right. Right. Okay, so this itself is not actually the amount of overshoot because this is your steady state value, right? That's that sort of final value that you will eventually reach. Uh, this is where we're going to get the overshoot from, right? That's where we, we actually compute the amount of overshoot. Um, and so the maximum overshoot is basically equal to e to the minus sigma times tp, but we've just computed a formula for t sub p, which is pi over omega. Okay? Um, relating this back to, okay, so we don't necessarily want to leave it in this form um, because it's sometimes more convenient to, to relate the overshoot to the damping ratio, but we have, we have an expression that allows us to convert Right, we're going to take advantage of these conversions here so that we can relate the overshoot to the damping ratio, which is a more useful parameter for the overshoot. Okay? So if I make the substitution here, that sigma equals zeta omega n, and I also invoke the conversion that omega is 1 minus zeta squared omega n, basically plug those into here, then I get a different form of the maximum overshoot, which is e to the minus zeta pi divided by square root 1 minus zeta squared. Okay, and this is what you'll see in, in uh, most textbooks, typically, is this, this version of the overshoot. Now remember that this... Um, this itself is going to give you a decimal value, but the overshoot itself is generally given as a percent. So you'll usually have to convert this value to uh, a percent. Okay. okay, so now we've got the peak time, the overshoot. The settling time has to do with this sort of exponential envelope function. Okay, so the settling time itself really is only concerned with this e to the minus sigma t. Right, this is the only part of this entire analytical function that makes this response decay. Right, and so remember the settling time is we're trying to find out how long does it take for our response to be within say plus or minus one percent or maybe plus or minus two percent. Okay, so for the settling time, 
we basically just focus in on the envelope function. Right? So the envelope function itself is that e to the minus sigma t. Um, and all we really have to do is define the percentage uh, uh, that we want to set that settling time for. So if we say, um, okay, so define that as e to the minus sigma t s equals 0 0.01, that would be for a 1% settling time. So we'd basically just solve for t of s, and you just have to take the, the natural log of both sides to solve for um, uh, t of s. Okay, so let's not skip that step. So it ends up working out to be sigma t s is equal to minus natural log of 0 0.01. And this, when you, when you compute this, you get the settling time is equal to uh, approximately 4.6 over sigma, right? And and that's because it's an approximation because we took minus the log of 0.01, right? So this is specific to a 1% settling time. Um, now later in the lecture, I'll I'll do some comparisons between our hand calculations and what uh, a numerical program like MATLAB has to say about this. Um, MATLAB actually uses a 2% settling time by default. Okay, so for MATLAB, um, the computation is going to actually be a little bit different. It's not going to be 4.6. You'll end up having to solve for minus natural log of 0 0.02. You'll plug in a different percentage here, divide that by sigma, and that would be for a 2% settling time. Okay, so if you ask for 5% settling time, basically you're just going to replace the argument inside of the natural log function. Okay, so we've got our, uh, what do we have so far? Peak time, overshoot, settling time. Uh, now the rise time itself, the rise time, which remember is a measure of the speed of that response, right? The amount of time it takes to get from 10% to 90% uh, of the final value. We could compute that time, right? There, There is a way to compute that analytically. Um, you would need some placeholder expression for the final value, uh, which introduces a new variable. And also, you are not certain about what the particular uh, damping ratio is for that uh, generic system. Um, so, so typically what happens is if you want to get an expression for the rise time, Generally, you have to make an assumption about um, uh, zeta, right? So you, you make an assumption about zeta. And you assume that it's equal to 0 0.5. If you get, if you make this assumption, then the computation for the rise time becomes very straightforward. Um, it, but you have to keep in mind that this is an approximation. Um, it's more of a heuristic formula for the rise time, um, and it, it works out to be very clean if you make that assumption. And so I think that's why a lot of textbooks adopt this notation, because it's pretty it's a pretty good approximation for very little effort um, when it comes to making that, uh, doing that computation. Okay, so <clears throat> you just have to remember, if your actual zeta is not very close to 0 0.5, then this approximation for the rise time gets less and less accurate. Okay, if if your zeta is exactly equal to 0 0.5, then this rise time computation is uh, very accurate. Okay. Okay. So we have now We have now an expression for all four of the response parameters, peak time, overshoot, settling time, and rise time. And notice that on the right-hand side of every one of these equations is one of either the pole location uh, parameters or the system properties. So we've got omega here, which is the imaginary component of the pole, zeta here, which is the um, damping ratio, sigma, which is a real component of the pole, and then omega n, which is your undamped natural frequency. Now this is extremely powerful because even for the overshoot and the rise time, which are not in terms of the poles, they're in terms of damping ratio and omega n, we have a conversion factor to relate those back to the pole locations, which is really, really handy. Okay, So this is a big step here, a big uh, 
uh, a big milestone for the lecture is relating the response parameters to the actual system properties and or the poles. That was a, that was a big step that we just took. So changing gears a little bit here, if we now look at the poles of that generic second order system, Okay, we're going to look at the poles of the generic second order transfer function. Um, well, the poles themselves are equal to, uh, let me just, I, I better rewrite this here. So, so, so P of S, remember that the definition of the generic second order transfer function comes in sort of two flavors. One's in terms of the poles, like this and one is in terms of system properties, like omega n and zeta. Okay, now the poles of this transfer function are defined as s equals minus sigma plus or minus j omega. Right? So a pair of complex poles, and those poles live in the s-plane. So yeah, the S plane is basically just a complex plane. Uh, but what I want to do is basically give you a quick review of complex numbers. Okay, so the poles, let's suppose uh, one pole exists out here. Then the location of this pole in terms of sigma and omega, minus sigma plus omega. Okay, so omega is the imaginary component. Uh, sigma is the negative real part of the pole. The way that omega n and zeta fit in to this picture, um, you have to understand how that works in order to understand the next step. Okay, so omega n is basically the distance from the origin to that particular complex value. Okay, so this is omega n there. It's basically a radius from the origin to that particular complex value. And then zeta itself doesn't appear directly on this uh, diagram, um, but it does appear indirectly as it relates to this angle measured from the imaginary axis down to a line that intersects that complex value. So we call this angle beta, and beta is proportionally related to zeta through the arc sine function. Okay, so this diagram is what you need in order to fully understand uh, essentially the next portion of the lecture, which is when we're actually going to start relating the pole location back to the uh, specification. Okay. okay, so let's get on with it. Right, A typical specification, typical spec, uh, might look something like might look something like this. Okay, so the settling time needs to be less than some given value. The rise time needs to be less than some given value. And maybe the overshoot needs to be less than some known value. Okay, so, so we might have to satisfy all three of these things for our customer to be happy, right? Um, and, and this is, we're getting into how this concept actually applies in the real world. For example, you know, if you're working for a consulting company doing control system design for maybe some industrial warehouse where you've got robots moving boxes from point A to point B, for instance, you might be designing um, a robotic manipulator to move items from one location to another, but maybe that final location is next to a wall or something. Um, something that can't be interfered with. And so if your robot control system picks up the, you know, the, the block from point A and moves it over to point B, but the controller is designed such that 50% overshoot is acceptable, well, before it gets to the final value, it may crash into the wall and destroy some of the, you know, whatever's in those boxes. Okay, so as one example, the specification may be driven by geographic or physical limitations of the space, right? You can't exceed a certain amount of overshoot, otherwise you'll physically break something. Um, it may also be driven by 
uh, I hate to say it, it may be driven by money, right? Um, it's very, it's relatively easy to design a control system where everything moves super slow, right? You have really good control. You can move things very slowly from point A to B with basically no overshoot, and it just converges on the final value very uh, smoothly. So you may have a super long rise time, but if your robot can only move 10 boxes per hour from point A to point B, you may be losing out financially as a company when compared to a robot that can move 100 boxes from point A to point B, right? So it's all about sort of the, the real world applications that generally drive this specification. Um, and that's where you as a control systems engineer have to take that information and figure out what type of control is required to satisfy that specification. Okay, okay so tangent over. Um, a typical specification may look something like this nonetheless. Okay, so what we're going to do basically is the very next step we want to take is to learn how to convert a specification essentially into a desired pole region, as we'll call it. Um, this specification will ultimately translate to some space within the S-plane where you want to place your closed loop poles. Okay, So let's see how that works. For the settling time, for example, settling time itself, we want it to be less than some known value, capital TS. This is given to you by the, your, your client or whoever you're working for. Okay, So you, you need to make sure your settling time is less than that number. Well, the settling time, we have an expression for it. We said it was, at least for a 1% settling time, the settling time is 4.6 over sigma. So what we're saying is 4.6 over sigma, that needs to be less than some known value. Uh, what we can do from here is, well, this places a condition on sigma. This would say that sigma itself needs to be greater than 4.6 over that known uh, settling time value. And remember that sigma is the negative real part of the pole of the actual transfer function. So in the S-plane, this translates to essentially a vertical line, right? Sigma needs to be greater than this value, okay? But the pole location itself is negative sigma. So the pole itself would be, would need to be to the left, so more negative than this value. Okay, so sigma needs to be greater than this value, which means the pole location needs to be further to the left of this value, which means that as long as the pole location is anywhere to the left of that vertical line, we will satisfy the settling time by definition. Ma mathematically, we're guaranteed to satisfy the settling time if the poles exist somewhere in this shaded region, which we'll call the desired pole region. Let's look at the next component of the specification. The rise time needs to be less than some given value. Well, we have an expression for the rise time. That's 1.8 over omega n. That needs to be less than some given value. Uh, but this puts a constraint on omega n. Okay, this would say that omega n needs to be greater than 1.8 over some known value. So everything on the right side of the inequality is known. Omega n, remember, is the distance from the origin to that complex value. So it's like a radius, like a, it's like a swinging arm that pivots about the origin. Uh, this relates to the pole location in the following way. If omega n needs to be greater than some known value, then essentially the radius, right, you're, you're basically sweeping out a radius from the origin and saying that, well, omega n, which is the distance from the origin to that radius needs to be larger than some known value. So actually, we need to place the poles out here somewhere, outside of this semicircular range here. And if our poles are outside of that range, then by definition, again, we should satisfy the rise time specification. The last one here that we're doing in this example is the overshoot needs to be less than some known value. Well, we have an expression for the overshoot. It's e to the minus zeta pi over 1 minus zeta squared. That needs to be less than some given value. And this places a constraint on zeta. Okay, so this would say that zeta, and this one's a little bit trickier mathematically, but you can see how it works out to solve for zeta here. This would say that zeta needs to be larger than the following. 
And all I've done here is basically solved for zeta in this inequality. So it's the square root of all of this. So zeta itself needs to be larger than some known value. That's kind of what we're getting at here. And remember, zeta is proportional through the arc sine function to the angle beta. Okay, so zeta itself is proportional to beta, and beta is the angle measured from the imaginary axis. And if that angle needs to be larger than some known value, then what we're basically saying is, well, you need to, you need to be sort of within this cone defined by this angle beta, right? So we need to be larger than some critical uh, angle beta, and that's defined by this inequality here. So we need to have our poles sort of inside of this cone-shaped region in the s-plane. And again, if our poles are somewhere in this shaded region, by definition, we will satisfy the overshoot specification. Okay? Thing is, a specification usually has multiple components. You have to, not just any one of these, you have to satisfy all of these um, simultaneously, which means that we're going to end up superimposing these um, desired pole regions upon one another. So all together you may look at, you may end up seeing um, some desired pole region that looks rather interesting. right? You may have something like, uh, well this, this would be for my, this would be for my settling time, I need to be I need to be within this cone to satisfy my overshoot but I also need to be I don't know outside of this radius to satisfy my uh, rise time okay so all together you have to look at the outermost boundary and what you end up with is often some pretty strange looking pole boundaries so something like this would be all of these combined into one. So what I'm saying here is if my poles end up in this shaded region where they satisfy all of those pole boundaries, then we will satisfy all elements of the specification. Okay, so we call this the desired pole region. And the goal is, well, if our poles are in that region, hey, mathematically, we will definitely satisfy all elements of the specification. Now, this is a good place to mention that when we do close the feedback loop, which we haven't yet, right? So when we actually do close loop control design, well, the main point of doing closed loop control design is that you get to place the closed loop poles essentially anywhere you want in the S-plane if you design your controller properly. Okay, so you get to choose where the closed loop poles live in the S-plane um, as a function of what controller you designed. Okay, so later this this idea of, well, here's a desired pole region, later this is all going to fit into place because now we know where the poles need to be, we just have to design a controller that allows us to place our poles where they need to be. Okay, but we're not quite there, we're still learning about first of all, that there is such a thing called desired pole region, and that if our poles are in that region, we will satisfy some specification. Okay, So before we fully jump into control design around this concept, um, we're going we're gonna to stay in this, in this zone for a little bit longer and do a couple more examples. Okay, But that is what's coming. Okay, so let's take... Um, Let's take the most basic usage of this uh, of this type of, of, of uh, concept. Okay, the the very first thing you'll want to get practice doing is pretty much what we just did. You'll want to convert. Uh, you'll want to be able to convert a given specification into a desired pole region. Okay, so this is this example is very it's almost trivial. It's the it's exact same thing we just did, but with some real numbers. Okay, so you may get a specification that looks like uh, like this. Okay, I need the rise time to be less than six seconds because the system has to be fast enough for it to be financially viable. I need my overshoot to be less than 17% so that I don't crash into the robot that's next to this device. I need the settling time to be less than 9.2 seconds because 
the next robot in line to pick up this object can't pick it up if if the settling if it's still like oscillating for example right so i need the the system to fully settle uh, before 9.2 seconds for example okay whatever the case whatever if this is industrial system or some robotic system whatever it is this is the specification that i need to satisfy um, what I want to do is turn this into a desired pole region. So, so based on this information, where do my poles of the system need to be? Desired pole region. Okay, so where is it? Uh, well, I will do the same thing we just did, is a direct application of the, the expressions that we derived for all of these response parameters. So, so the rise time was... 1.8 over omega n so that needs to be less than 0.6 seconds which means well omega n needs to be greater than 3 okay these are one liners this is pretty straightforward okay overshoot needs to be less than 0.17 ah well this is a little bit you want to be careful here remember in the specification overshoot is generally given as a percent mathematically you got to convert it to a decimal for the equation to apply so what I'm saying here is that e to the minus zeta pi over root one one minus zeta squared. That whole thing needs to be less than not 17 but 0.17. Uh, when I solve for zeta in this equation, I get that zeta itself needs to be greater than 0.49, which is roughly 0.5. Now remember, zeta itself doesn't appear on the s-plane, right? Beta is the actual angle uh, measured from the imaginary axis that uh, uh, shows up on the s-plane. So we would actually need to convert, right? Because beta is equal to the arc sine of zeta. Through this conversion, we can find out that beta would actually need to be greater than about 30 degrees. Okay, and so this is the one that you actually want to uh, compute because that's what actually appears on the s-plane. The last one is the settling time. Pretty straightforward. The settling time is given for 1% settling time as 4.6 over uh, sigma. That needs to be less than 9.2 seconds, which means sigma has got to be greater than 0.5. Okay, so between all three of those uh, uh, requirements, we can put them on the s plane to see essentially what our overall desired pole region needs to needs to be okay so if we kind of take a look here uh, let's do this a little bit more accurately here so we can see okay so here's our real axis our imaginary axis uh, we know that uh, sigma needs to be greater than 0.5 so if this is one uh, this is negative one this is negative two this is negative 0.5. Remember, sigma is the real part, uh, is a negative real part of the pole. So if sigma needs to be greater than some value, the pole itself needs to be less than the negative of that value. So here's negative 0.5. And remember that we want our poles to be actually more negative than that. Right? So that would imply that zeta is greater than 0.5. Okay, so there's negative 0.5. Um, uh, we want omega n to be greater than 3. Right? Omega n is the distance from the origin to that point. So it's basically a radius, and we need this radius to be greater than point, uh, greater than 3. So something like this. Okay, so there's negative 3. We need our poles to be outside of this semicircular region. And then finally, beta needs to be greater than 30 degrees. So uh, drawing roughly 30 degrees from the imaginary axis, we get something like this. Something like this. Okay, so we need to be within the, the cone defined by that 30 degrees to the left of this vertical line and outside of this semicircular region. So overall, our overall desired pole boundary is defined by this, I don't know, kind of bat signal shaped thing. Right? It's like a sideways Batman signal. Yes, I'm a nerd. Okay, so our, our desired pole region is now actually out here. 
Okay, which is kind of interesting because what you could do with this information is actually you could um, you could go back to your boss or your client and actually provide them a higher level of service. You can say, oh, by the way, I was I was reviewing your specification uh, and you've got a redundancy in your specification, right? So I can save you a little bit of money by removing that requirement. And then now, look, you've got a relationship with that company and they're going to hire you for the next job. What I mean by that is if you look at this specification, I could basically ask you the question of, okay, which which element of the specification do I get for free as long as I satisfy the other two, right? I think that question makes sense. And the answer is it's the settling time specification. So as long as I satisfy the rise time and the overshoot, I will satisfy the, the settling time specification automatically just because of the nature of the numbers that were given. Notice that the settling time was given by the vertical line, so I need to be to the left of this vertical line in order to satisfy the, the settling time. But I'm already going to be to the left of that line if I'm in my desired pole boundary, which is only defined by the uh, overshoot and the rise time specification. Okay, so that's sort of an interesting little subtlety that comes out from this example. Uh, nonetheless, it's it's a very basic example. It's just, just directly applying those equations that we got to uh, defining uh, the pole boundary in the S plane. All right, so this was like the first example. It's a pretty basic example. Uh, the second example. Uh, and there's only two for this lecture. The second example is actually a two-parter. Um, the first part of the example, we're actually going to compute the response parameters given um, a dynamic system and, and really nothing else. Um, so we'll have to go through the whole process of computing the system response parameters. Uh, but in the second part of the problem, we're going to turn things around a little bit and actually do a bit of design. Okay, so for the first time, we'll look at um, sort of some design element uh, for that for that uh, second part of the problem. Okay, so this problem starts with our one of our favorite sort of quintessential second order systems, mass spring damper system, like so. Like so. Okay, so you've got some second order mass spring damper system. This is just like our second order generic system. Um, only now we're going to give it some actual values. Uh, M equals 2 kilograms, C is equal to 8 newton seconds per meter, and the spring constant, we'll put it at 200, so relatively stiff spring. And based on this, the goal here, the question is actually to find, right, so if we were to apply a step, uh, step input to this system, find those response parameters. So we want to actually figure out what all those are. So that's the first part of the problem. Um, in order to do that, we need we need the transfer function associated with this system. Um, this is a simple modeling problem. So we're just going to you know analyze the forces, um, do uh, Newton's second law, generate the differential equation, take the Laplace transform of both sides. This is back to the first lecture when we're doing modeling of dynamic systems. So through that process, we're going to model it to get an ODE. The ODE, we're going to take the Laplace transform of that to get a transfer function. And that's where we're going to start for this example. So the transfer function from the input force U to the output displacement X, we'll call that P of S. And that has the form of 1 over MS squared plus CS plus Okay, uh, I believe this might have even been one of the exact examples in the first lecture. I'm not sure. Uh, nonetheless, with some real numbers now, with some real values, we can actually get um, a numeric transfer function. So this is going to look like 1 over 2s squared plus 8s plus 200. Um, what I'm going to do, okay, so this is our transfer function. And what we're going to try and do is to figure out all four of those response parameters. And the way we need to do that is there's an intermediate step. We want to we want to use those four equations that we derived early on in the lecture so that we can 
apply those to find these values. But really, if I'm asking you to find all these parameters, what we what we really need are uh, the poles, right? We need sigma and omega, and we also need the system properties like omega n and zeta, right? So we need these, and if we had these, then we could get um, those response parameters very easily by plugging into the equations. Well, the question is, how do you get these from the transfer function? It's relatively straightforward. It, it all boils down to uh, equating your real transfer function back to the generic second order transfer function. Okay, so what I mean by that is we want to compare this back to one or you know one or the other of those um, original generic second order transfer functions. Um, what I mean is what I mean is this already has the form of omega n squared over s squared plus two zeta omega n s plus omega n squared. We're going to equate that to what we actually have. Um, the only hiccup here is that the leading coefficient on our transfer function is 2, whereas the leading coefficient on the generic form is 1. And if we're going to equate the coefficients, so those um, it'd be more convenient if those leading coefficients matched. Um, so what we end up doing is basically factoring. Right? So we'll factor out the 1 half um, here. So we'll pull the 1 half out of the denominator, and then we're left with 1 over s squared plus 4s plus 100. Notice, too, that the 100 here, which represents omega n, we don't see that in the numerator. Right? So if we really wanted to go the extra mile and make these two transfer functions uh, identical, well, we could put the 100 there and then just divide out by 100 over here. Right now these two things, the 1 half and the 100, those are just constant gains. Right, Those don't influence the actual system dynamics, those just influence the amplitude of the output. Uh, but those that uh, the fact that there's these um, non-unity gains, those aren't going to change the rise time, peak time, settling time, and overshoot at all. All we're trying to do is get the transfer function, the core transfer function, uh, to be of the same form as the generic transfer function. Once we have that, we can go ahead and equate the coefficients. So, well, 1 is equal to 1. That doesn't give us any additional information. But omega n squared, well, if we equate the s to the 0 terms, we get that omega n squared equals 100. So I'm actually able to compute omega n as equal to 10. That's nice. With omega n is equal to 10, I can then equate the next term which is the s to the 1 term, and I get an equation that says 2 zeta omega n is equal to 4. I'm trying to solve for zeta, and I, I now know omega n, right? So there's only one unknown in this equation, and that gives me that zeta is equal to 0.2. Now, with zeta and omega n, I simply have to use the conversion factors to get sigma and omega. So I know that sigma is equal to uh, zeta times omega n. So I get that sigma is equal to 2 through the conversion factor. And finally, omega is equal to root 1 minus zeta squared times omega n. So that I get omega n is equal to 9.8. I'm sorry, that omega equals 9.8. Okay. Um, as long as zeta is non-zero, your damped natural frequency is always going to be less than your uh, undamped natural frequency. Okay, But now I've got all the parameters that I need to plug into my four equations so that I can compute so that I can compute the uh, step response parameters. And so plugging all these into my four equations, I'm going to get that the rise time, which is 1.8 over omega n, well, that's going to be 1.8 over 10, so the rise time is going to be 0.18 seconds. Peak time, remember that was pi over omega. Well, omega here is 9.8, so I get basically the peak time of 0.32 seconds. Um, so you can kind of see what I'm doing, just plugging into the original functions that we derived earlier on. Um, m sub p works out to be 52, I'm sorry, 0.527. But remember, your 
calculation is always going to give you a decimal value. So this is going to equate to 52.7% overshoot. And then finally, my settling time uh, for the 1% settling time, that's 4.6 over sigma, where sigma is equal to 2. So I get that is 2.3 seconds for a 1% settling time. What I'm going to do in just a couple of minutes is compare our analytical work to the numerical values computed in MATLAB. And remember I said MATLAB gives you a 2% settling time by default. So we can easily enough compute um, a 2% settling time by plugging into minus natural log of 0 0.02 rather than 0 0.01 and dividing that by sigma. And so that's going to give me 1.96 seconds for a 2% settling time. Okay, so that's my 2% settling time there. Um, let's go over to MATLAB now and actually see if our hand calculations agree with the numerical value. Okay, so there's a quick little script here that will allow us to take the step response of a particular uh, second order system. Uh, I'm going to just first define the Laplace variable using the TF function. And then, as a function of that Laplace vari variable S, I can define the plant itself and then look at the step response for that system. Now, the parameters we had at first were uh, here, MS2, MS2, C is 8, K is 200. Um, all we're going to do is plug those values into the plant transfer function and take the step response. And that looks like, uh, that ends up looking like this. Okay, that looks like this right here. Now if we look a little bit more closely, right, this is MATLAB's default um, step response. I didn't use any left-handed arguments here, which means I can actually right-click into the white space, look at characteristics, and just bring up things like the peak response, um, uh, all the rise time, settling time, all the, all the response parameters that we're interested in, in looking at. I think those are the only ones we need. Okay, so let's look for, uh, okay, here's the rise time, first of all. It says rise time is 0.121 seconds. So by our calculation, uh, our rise time said it was supposed to be 0.18 seconds. Okay, uh-oh. So we're 0 for 1 here. Um, the reason, remember, is that the rise time uh, expression that we are using is a heuristic approximation for when um, zeta is equal to 0.5. Uh, for this particular example, zeta was equal to 0 0.2 when we when we calculated it. So we actually shouldn't expect the numerical accurate response to equal our analytical computation, which is what we're seeing here. So that's why that number is off. Hopefully everything else lines up, though. If we look at the peak time here, we see that the peak time occurs at 0 0.322 seconds. So that's right on with our calculation. The overshoot is 52.7%. That's exactly what we computed by our... Uh, equations. And then notice the settling time gives us 1.96 seconds. Now, remember, if we compared that to the 1% settling time, that would have been off. But remember that MATLAB gives 2% by default. So if we plugged into this 2% settling time computation, then our calculations are right on. Okay, so this is uh, essentially just a demonstration that um, all of these analytical computations that we're doing do in fact agree, for the most part, with the numerical um, uh, the numerical response. Okay, so I did mention that this example uh, contains two parts. Um, and so the first part of the example is relatively straightforward, just going through uh, the dynamic system, uh, get the transfer function, and then compute these uh, the step response parameters. Um, so that does agree pretty well with the MATLAB uh, code and the numerical response. However, it's not a super interesting problem. Um, what I thought we could do is, because we haven't introduced feedback control, we can't actually close the loop and do any design that way. Um, but one thing that stands out to me is if you look at this value here, 52.7% um, overshoot. Um, I can't think of many real-life systems where that amount of overshoot would be 
acceptable. Uh, that's it, it's just too much for for whatever the system is to be practical. Um, you know, what, one example of that would be let's take an elevator control system, right? An elevator system is basically just only step responses, right? So you get into the elevator on the first floor, you push three, um, and so you want to go up two floors. You're basically setting the reference from the ground level up to the third floor. Okay, so you're setting a step response, and your elevator is just going to track until it gets to the third floor, and the doors open, you get out. Well, if you design a control system that allows for 52.7% overshoot, and you want to go up, uh, you know, two, uh, three floors, uh, that means that you're going to end up going 50% beyond that. So you're going to go to the four and a half floor before coming back down and eventually settling at the third floor. So that's just, it's not a practical design. Uh, I feel like this particular scenario with 52.7% overshoot is, it, you can apply it almost anywhere and, and the result ends up becoming kind of ridiculous. Like if you, if you take your cruise control example, for example, you know, you set, you set it to go 60 miles an hour. Uh, well, 50% overshoot means your vehicle is going to take you to 90 miles an hour, right? 50% beyond 60 before ultimately settling down back at 60, right? So, so that's that's not a good, not a good scenario. Um, you get the idea, right? HVAC systems, right? So you go, right? It's a, it's a, it's a cold winter day, and you set your thermostat for 70 degrees. Well, with 52.7% overshoot, your system is going to take your indoor temperature to uh, 130 degrees. No, uh, 100 and something, 110 degrees, really hot, basically, before it comes back and settles. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make here is that 52.7% overshoot is alarming in almost every scenario. Okay, so we want to reduce that for sure. Um, now, with feedback control, the beauty of feedback control is you don't even have to touch the plant itself. You can close the loop on uh, that particular system, and you could adjust these values through your controller design. Because we haven't done that yet, another way to um, adjust, for example, these, these uh, system parameters would be to do a little bit of tuning. Okay, so the question after all this... Um, setup. Can we tune the damper such that, such that, ST means such that, such that the maximum overshoot is, say, less than 10%. That's a little bit more acceptable. Um, let's see if we can tune the damper. Right? Let's say we already bought the mass, we already have the spring installed, um, but we haven't bought the damper yet, so we can specify the damper that we want to use, and maybe we actually want to satisfy this specification. Okay, so let's say that we want the overshoot to be less than 10%, but we don't want to slow the system down so much that it's really sluggish. So we still want the peak time to be less than 0.5 seconds, right? So what we're saying is we want the system to still respond pretty quickly, but not have more than 10% overshoot, right? So the question is, can we adjust the C value, which originally was equal to 8, right? Can we adjust this so that we we have a better looking response, right? So what I'm saying is, now that's not fixed. Now that's a question mark as to what C should be. Um, and that's the question. That's the second part of this problem. And it's kind of an interesting practical application of that. Uh, and it's easy enough to apply the things that we've learned throughout this lecture to solve that problem. Okay, so remember, with the, with the, the system that we're given, we've got a transfer function that looks like this. So it was um, ms squared, so 2s squared, plus cs, now c is a variable now, plus 200. So we're just going to leave it like that. Um, and remember, we, we want to equate this to the uh, generic second order system at some point. So it's nicer to have a leading coefficient of 1 here. Uh, we can do that by basically uh, dividing top and bottom by a half. Okay, so we get our leading coefficient of 1. Uh, that means that this coefficient is c over 2. And we've got 200 divided by 2, which becomes 100. Now remember, this is just a gain. So the fact that it doesn't match that 100 
is a little bit irrelevant. It doesn't affect the actual core dynamics of the system, which again are defined by the poles or the denominator of the transfer function. Okay, so this is fine to work with for now. What we're trying to do is we can really pick either one of these specifications. We can start with the overshoot or we can start with the peak time and figure out what values of C would satisfy that and then just check the other uh, uh, specification to see if that works. Okay, so let's start with the peak time. This is a little bit arbitrary, but the peak time is defined by pi over omega. And we're going to want to relate things back to zeta because zeta is what we can relate to this um, middle term, right? Because this is the 2 zeta omega n term, right? So we want to relate things back to zeta. One way to do that for the peak time is to make a substitution that says, well, the peak time is equal to pi over omega, which is equal to 1 minus zeta squared omega n. Okay, and the thing is, I already know what omega n is. Uh, omega n will not change as a function of changing uh, the damper C. Okay, so in this equation, if we re relate the peak time to this uh, representation of the peak time, what we end up getting is uh, an equation, right? So we can equate these two together and try to solve for zeta, right? So what I want to do is I know the peak time that I want is 0.5 seconds. I know omega n is 10. Let's just figure out what value of zeta we need to accomplish that. Um, the way to do that is to solve for zeta in this equation. So we're going to say that root 1 minus zeta squared, that should be equal to pi over t sub p times omega n. Let me clean that up a little bit. Okay, so I'm just solving for zeta here. I'm going to square both sides, um, add 1 to both sides, and then multiply by a negative. Okay, so I'm basically just solving for zeta. And what I end up with is that zeta should be equal to root 1 minus pi squared over peak time squared times omega n squared. Okay. Now, the thing is, I know everything on the right-hand side of this equation. Right? No, I know that the peak time I want is equal to 0.5. Right? That's desired. And I know that my omega n is equal to 10 because my spring constant hasn't changed. So what this means is that I can compute zeta. Zeta is equal to, if I just plug into this equation, 0.78. This is a value of zeta that should satisfy the peak time. Right? That's, that's how we computed this value of zeta. We can't be, be certain that it will satisfy both elements of the specification, so we need to now check to see if this value of zeta will satisfy the overshoot requirement. Okay, so let's, let's check that. The way to check that is simply to apply uh, our expression for the overshoot. Okay, so the maximum overshoot is given by minus zeta, which is 0.78 pi. This is not equals. This should be e to the minus zeta pi over 1 minus zeta squared. And what you get here is that the maximum overshoot works out to 0 0.0204, but remember that's a decimal, so our maximal overshoot will be 2.04%. And 2.04% is far less than the allowed 10%, so what I've done here is I've found a value of zeta that should work to satisfy both elements of the specification. However, the question was not to find the value of zeta, it was to find the value of c that would satisfy both elements of the specification. But now that I know what zeta is, it's easy enough to equate this uh, s to the 1 term with the generic second order transfer function. What I mean by that is we're going to look at the transfer function we have, which is s squared plus c over 2 s plus 100, and equate that to our generic second order denominator, like so. Okay, So I already know that omega n is equal to 100 when I equate these two. Sorry, omega n should be equal to 10 because omega n squared is 100. But when I equate these two terms together, this is where I'm going to get my computation for c. So c over 2 should be equal to 2 zeta omega n, 
and I've verified that zeta equals 0.78 should work for this application, and omega n has not changed. That's still equal to 10. So this gives me a value of c is equal to 31.1 uh, newton seconds per meter. Okay. 31.1 should work to satisfy both elements of the specification. Okay, we've, we've verified it mathematically. If we want to verify it numerically, one thing we can do is go back to our uh, numerical program in MATLAB here, and we can actually check to see if our design for the damper actually works. Remember that before we made this adjustment, our uh, overshoot was, was essentially the, the problem here. We had 52.7% overshoot, which like we said is no good for, for really any scenario. So what we said now is if we increase the damping from 8 to 31.1, that should give us a scenario where we satisfy both elements of the specification. We should have a peak time less than 0.5 and a, a overshoot less than 10%. In fact, the overshoot should be exactly equal to 2.04%. Let's see if that's true numerically. So this becomes our step response when we increase the damping to 31.1. And what you can see if we look at the peak response is that indeed we get a peak time of 0.498 seconds. Now that's essentially equal to 0.5 seconds. Okay, so if you think about it, that's right on the upper limit of uh, what the peak time is supposed to be, but it should be no surprise that the peak time is exactly 0.5 seconds because that's how we designed this particular damper. As we said, with the peak time equal at its upper limit of 0.5 seconds, you should use a zeta of 0.78. Um, the corresponding overshoot becomes 2.06%, which is awfully close to our 2.04% computation. Okay, so this in, does indeed satisfy that specification, and so we have tuned the damper to satisfy um, the, that element of the specification. And this is a much better design, right, for, for almost any example you can think of. However, I would say, the one last thing that I would say is that, remember, this 31.1 is not the only answer, right? Remember that if you look at the specification, uh, it said that we want to satisfy less than 10% and less than 0.5 seconds. So what I would say is that we are on the very limit of this peak time. We are exactly at 0.5 seconds peak time, it, but we have a little bit of overshoot to spare. So as a design standpoint, as an engineer, I'm saying 31.1 is our upper limit on that end of the spectrum. Maybe we ought to dial it back a little bit so that we're more comfortably within both of these um, uh, zones. Okay, so what I mean by that is, well, let's just, let's, instead of 31.1, let's just bring that back down a little bit. Let's dial it back to, say, 25 and see what that looks like. Okay, so at, at 25 instead of 31, the response now looks like this. So what you're seeing is, well, we've got a little bit more overshoot. We're at 8% 8, 8 overshoot, so a little bit more than 2% but our peak time is 0.4 seconds. So we're more comfortably within both of these ranges of the specification. So I would argue that this is a better uh, design. But remember, you know, the engineering component of this is application specific. Okay, so I don't know what system this represents necessarily. Um, it may be that we want to push the upper limit of the peak time and the previous ex example of 31.1 is better. Um, for me, as uh, at this generic level, I would say let's just aim to be more comfortably within those two specifications, and a value of C is equal to 25 ends up getting getting us there uh, more comfortably. Okay, so what's going on here? I don't know. Some kind of errors. Okay, so uh, we've done a lot of stuff. Uh, we've introduced this new idea of the time domain specification. Um, a lot of stuff has happened, okay? So we're still, remember, we're still working with the plant here. We haven't actually closed the loop, but now we have this vocabulary for analyzing second order step responses um, through the parameters like the rise time, peak time, overshoot, settling time. 
And we also have a, mach a mathematical mechanism for relating those back to the pole locations. Okay, so that's that's the main takeaway from this lecture is now that we know, uh, for example, whatever specifi specification we're given, we know where the poles should be such that we satisfy that specification. Okay, so that's a huge stepping stone because almost the next thing we're going to do, not quite the next thing, but almost the next thing we're going to do is to then realize that through closed loop design, we can place our closed loop poles anywhere we want. Right? We, can, we can basically take whatever system we're dealing with and through feedback control, we can actually place the closed loop poles, poles in a different location, presumably placing them within the desired pole region to satisfy whatever given specification uh, that we're dealing with. Okay, so before we do that and fully close the loop, uh, the next lecture is going to deal with stability, which is incredibly important, and so we need to discuss stability before we jump in and fully um, uh, uh, sort of formally define feedback control and start doing some control design. Okay, so until then, um, we'll see you in the next one, which is about stability, and then after that, we're going to fully jump into feedback control. So I'll see you in the next one.